Hey everyone, uh, my name's Ethan. I'm an engineer on the storage team at Cloudera. Um, I work on Apache Ozone. I'm a committer. I'm also on the project management committee. Um, so for those of you who maybe aren't that familiar with Ozone, Ozone is a distributed storage system that supports both HDFS and S3 protocols. Um, Ozone, um, one of the, the primary goals is being uh, fault tolerant. Um, so uh, as we're adding more nodes and scaling out, uh, we want to be able to make sure that as those nodes are failing, the system can kind of uh, self-heal and recover from all of those problems, and that's really what we're going to be digging into in today's presentation. There we go. All right, um, so first, let's quantify the types of failures that we're going to talk about in this presentation. Uh, the first thing we're going to talk about are network failures. So this is when one node in the system can't communicate with another node. Uh, this could be a temporary network issue that resolves itself after a short amount of time, or it could be a more serious network partition, um, in which case the two nodes are unable to communicate for an extended period of time, but both processes are still running. This is actually closely related to the next failure we're going to talk about, which is full node failure. Uh, the reason I say these are closely related is that in this example here, um, once the network is partitioned between node 1 and node 2, Node 1 has no idea if Node 2 is still up and running and they can't communicate, or if Node 2 itself has failed completely. The next failure we're going to talk about is disk failures. So this is when one drive within a node uh, fails out completely, um, but the node's process is still up and running. And we're going to talk about bit rot and corruption within an otherwise functioning disk. So we're going to start with a bit of background on ozone architecture before we talk about uh, how these failures fit into the broader system. First component is the metadata layer. Um, this is stored in a component we call the ozone manager. Um, so this is storing things like the names of your files, um, volumes and buckets, which are ozone's uh, namespace divisions, ACLs, file size, all of those kinds of things, but not the actual data within the files. That part is stored back in Ozone's block storage layer. The block storage layer is made of the data nodes, which scale out horizontally, and those data nodes report to the storage container manager, who is checking their health and capacity, um, and making decisions on uh, cluster membership and data placement based on those. These two components communicate so that the Ozone manager is aware of the locations of the data, and it can then communicate that back to the client. The Ozone client is going to talk to the Ozone managers for metadata operations, and based on this metadata and location data, it's going to go back to the corresponding data nodes to do the operations it needs to. The final component in the system that we're not going to talk too much about today is Recon. Um, Recon is Ozone's observability server that is periodically gathering information from all of the nodes and displaying that in a web UI. So the Ozone manager is the first component we're going to look at. Um, as we said, this is only storing metadata. Um, the Ozone RPC client is talking to the Ozone Manager for the metadata operations. If it's just doing something like a bucket create, um, the operation may only involve the Ozone Manager. If it needs to read or write data, it's going to use the metadata it gets from the Ozone Manager to go back to the data nodes to do that operation. So we've previously been saying treating the Ozone Manager as one thing. There's actually three of them in a high availability setup. Um, the data is replicated across all three, so all three Ozone managers have an identical copy of all of the metadata. And we are keeping this consistent using Apache Radis. This is a Raft implementation. Um, so Raft is a consensus algorithm where you have a leader and two followers, and any operations need to be committed to a majority of the quorum, so that would be uh, two-thirds of your three nodes here. Okay, so let's, uh, let's start by breaking some things. Uh, first thing we're going to look at is a network failure where the leader in our raft forum is completely partitioned from the two followers. So client talks to leader, leader can't communicate with any of the two followers. So what's going to happen here is since the two followers can still communicate, they are actually going to be able to elect a leader among themselves. So we have two of the three nodes still available, this is the majority, so they're able to make a decision on, the, uh, on behalf of the group and the leader who can no longer contact the two followers is going to step down after a timeout. 
And based on this, the raft group will reconfigure itself so that one of the followers becomes the new leader and the current leader steps down. So now we've changed which node the client needs to talk to. So after the leader election, the client is going to retry its read or write on the new leader. So every operation that's going through Raft is one atomic transaction. So the retry is not a problem. Either the retry succeeded on the path leader and was pushed through the quorum and committed, or the retry failed on the last leader because he couldn't get quorum, and the client's going to retry that same operation on the new leader. So there's no uh, partial state that would be seen as a result of this leader change. Now let's say this was just a temporary network partition that happened to last longer than the leader timeout. In that case, when the partition is resolved, the previous leader is going to uh, ping the other nodes and rejoin the forum, and it's going to get the current leader information. It will rejoin as a follower, and it will be caught back up with the information that the new leader has committed. Now let's look at a node failure. In this case, we're going to completely kill off one of the nodes. So uh, we need at least two of the three nodes up and running. Uh, so in this case, the client, because we killed off a follower, the client has no idea that this follower has gone down. Uh, that's only the leader's problem. So the client is going to send uh, its metadata operation to the leader. The leader is going to forward it to whatever followers are available. So in this case, it's going to be one of the followers. But we still have two of the three nodes, so that's okay. The system can keep running. Um, follower is going to act back to the leader that it has committed this. Then the leader is going to act back to the client that the data was successfully committed to a majority. Um, if this was a hard failure where the node needs to be completely replaced, um, you can we call it bootstrapping, where you can bootstrap the new node in. Um, and similar to what we saw in the network partition case, that node will ping the other two nodes to figure out its place in the quorum, uh, and then the system will return back to full availability. Now let's look inside one of the ozone managers. So in the OM, we have two disks. Um, one is storing the RADIS logs. So these aren't like uh, application logs for debugging. When we're saying logs here, um, this is like an enumerated list of every transaction that's gone through the RADIS forum. Uh, on the second disk is RocksDB. Um, this is our RADIS state machine. So RADIS is committing transactions to the log and then applying them to RocksDB. Now let's say that there's a failure on the database disk. We can't read or write from that database anymore. So one of the invariants of Raft is that um, when a, a node is going to apply a, or commit a transaction that, uh, or apply it to the database, it needs to have applied all of the previous transactions. So because of this, if you have a database failure in one of your nodes, that node can no longer apply any more transactions. Um, it's not like if you, um, you know, we can, we can get some but not the others. We have to have the uh, complete continuous set. So in this case, um, the ozone manager actually treats a failure to one of these disks as a fatal error. It's going to shut itself down and log an error and say, hey, I can't write to my database. You need to figure out what's going on here. Um, and as we saw previously, a leader election will happen in this case. The two followers, one of them will step up as the new leader, client retries, and the system keeps running while well, the admin can go in and look at uh, what happened to that disk on the ozone manager. If needed, you can plug in a new disk, restart that OM, and it can rejoin the cluster. Um, we also tend to recommend a RAID 1 setup um, on these metadata nodes. Um, I guess that would bring you to four disks instead of two. Um, but this also helps provide a little redundancy, uh, extra redundancy within the node against these disk failures. So, We've talked about the ozone managers. Now let's move back to the storage container managers. So storage container manager is also tracking metadata, but it's tracking a different type of metadata. It's tracking metadata about uh, storage containers, which is ozone's unit of replication. Uh, you can think of a storage container, it's just like a five gig uh, collection of block data, um, data that's mapped back to keys in the OM. And so SCM, what we call it for short, is tracking um, basically, you know, the, the name of the container, um, which nodes have it, um, which of those, if there's too many copies of that container, if there's not enough copies of that container, those kinds of things. But the actual data within that container is not in the storage container manager, it's in the data nodes. So SCM uh, actually looks pretty similar to OM in this case. Um, because it's just tracking metadata, 
we have three of them. Um, we're also going to replicate that data with Radis, and failure handling is going to look very similar to everything we just saw. Now let's look at SEM talking to the data nodes. Uh, so the data nodes are periodically going to send messages to SEM, which we call heartbeats. Uh, this is to let SEM know that they're still uh, alive and well. Um, data nodes will also attach reports to these heartbeats. This contains things um, like what containers they currently have, how much storage space they have available, um, what their progress is on various commands that SEM has sent back. Uh, SEM kind of has a heads up view of the state of all the data nodes, and it can use this to make decisions about uh, which containers may need to be replicated or deleted, um, and those kinds of things. So now let's bring a client into the picture. Um, let's say we have, in this case, we have data nodes heart beating to SEM, saying that they are still alive and well. Uh, and we have a client that is, say, writing data to a group of these data nodes. We usually call this a pipeline. Um, this, in this case, if we have three-way replicated data, um, we say this client is writing to three data nodes. We would call those three data nodes a write pipeline. So let's say one of these data nodes um, hasn't heartbeated to SEM after a given timeout. So in this case, SEM is going to call that data node stale. So it's basically going to uh, stop sending new writes to that data node and redirect the new writes to a different group of data nodes, a uh, different pipeline. One thing to note is that when a node gets marked stale, we actually do not trigger any re-replication yet. So in ozone, data nodes can be pretty dense. We support nodes up to half a petabyte. Um, so any sort of node failure is gonna trigger a lot of uh, expensive re-replication in the cluster. So we, we really wanna be sure that if we're marking a node as failed, that, um, that we're, we're pretty sure that that's the case and there's not some uh, network disconnect that's going to get resolved sooner. But if time goes on and that node never heartbeats to SCM, SCM is going to move it to the next state, which is dead. SCM is going to consider that that node is never coming back, and at this point, it's going to trigger replication of the existing data from other copies. Now let's move back one more layer and look inside the data nodes. So each data node is comprised of multiple volumes. Uh, volume is usually, it's usually a one-to-one -one mapping between a volume and a disk. Um, each of these disks can fail independently within the data node while the process is still running. If we look inside one of these disks, um, it's holding the actual data in the storage containers. So while SCM just has the metadata about which containers exist in the system, the data node has the actual data uh, within these storage containers. These containers are a five gig collection of blocks. Um, each of these blocks are the data that's making up the keys that are stored inside the ozone manager. The final thing you'll find on a data node volume is a RocksDB instance. This is holding the metadata about the storage containers that are on the volume. So disks on the data nodes can uh, also get pretty dense. Um, like 10 terabytes is pretty standard. Um, so we want to make sure that the data nodes are proactively checking these disks uh, to make sure that they're all in good health and the data is uh, still s stored securely. To do this, we have something that we call the volume scanner within the data node. Um, this is something that's going to be running in the background, looking at disk health um, and figuring out um, if the disks themselves are still up and running. Um, the volume scanner is mostly concerned with the, the overall disk health, it's not actually walking all of the data on the disk. We have another scanner that does that that we're gonna talk about in a minute. But this means that the volume scanners are relatively fast to run. Um, so you can think of this as kind of a smoke test to make sure that uh, the disk is in good health without having to go through um, all of the data on the disk, uh, you know, byte by byte. Um, and if there is some sort of failure of the disk in the data node, then we can re-replicate that data from other data nodes to restore it. So our volume scanner, we break it into uh, two pieces, the directory checks and the disk checks. The directory checks are uh, kind of like a prerequisite to the disk checks. Um, usually they're gonna be identifying configuration issues more than any hardware problem. Um, this is basically just checking that the configured mount point of the disk exists and that the data node process has the correct permission. 
So if any of these fail, then the data node has no way to reach the hardware in the first place, um, and we're going to bail out before we get into any further checks. Um, and this is probably uh, just a configuration issue that the admin would need to resolve. The disk checks is where we're actually going to touch the hardware. Um, and here we want to make sure, um, basically because the, um, the disk checks, things like uh, permissions and whatever, those can just be cached uh, in the OS. There's no guarantee that um, just because you uh, queried the file system and said, hey, is this directory there? There's no guarantee that that disk uh, is still there plugged into the system and running. So in this next step, we're actually going to go to touch the hardware. We're going to generate a byte string, write it to a temp file. We're going to make a sync call. That's going to make sure that the data is flushed out of all of the caches and actually hits the hardware. We're going to read it back, and then we're going to check it against what we had in memory and make sure that everything came back okay. And then finally, we can delete the file. So now we've made sure we've actually touched the hardware to verify that it's still there. Uh, what happens if any one of these steps fail? Should we fail the disk? Uh, well, probably not. Um, intermittent I.O. errors can happen, and remember if you're dealing with, um, you know, tens of terabytes per disk, um, that's going to be some expensive re-replication if you make a wrong call there. So what we're actually going to do is we're going to use multiple iterations of these disk checks over time uh, to try to get a better view of whether the disk is still functioning. Um, by default, we have a sliding window that's configured to look at the last three disk checks and look if the last two of them have succeeded. So let's say we run three disk checks. Maybe one of them failed. Um, for now, we're still going to say that volume's good. That could just be some sort of uh, intermittent error. It may not actually be a problem with the disk. Say we run another. Now we're looking at the last three. Disk is still good. Say we run another one and it fails. Um, now at this point, two of the last three disk checks have failed. Um, there's, this volume seems to be giving us errors somewhat consistently. Um, so we're going to want to proactively uh, fail this volume and trigger replication off of it. Um, another thing is if we keep faulty volumes in the data node, they're going to keep serving reads and writes for data. Um, and if there's some error during that process, the client is going to have to retry on another node. Um, so leaving flaky volumes um, you know, up and running in the data node um, can also actually lead to some performance problems in that sense. It's the, any client that ends up touching data on that volume and there's some error is going to need to retry. So in this case, the, the volume scanner is saying, hey, it looks like two-thirds of the time we touch this volume, we get some error back. That means, you know, two-thirds of the time a client is touching this volume, it's probably going to get some error back. Uh, we probably don't want to keep using this disk. So the next thing we're going to look at is the container scanners. So recall that the disk scanners are we're kind of trying to check overall uh, volume health, but we haven't actually looked at the data byte by byte on the disk to see if it's all still there, if it's all still consistent. So th for this, we have the container scanners. Um, these are going to actually be going through the content of all the containers, every block, and they're going to be looking at the checksums and the BroxDB metadata. Um, eventually, this is going to touch all of the data that's on the disk. Um, and again, if we find some sort of failure, we can trigger replication from another healthy source. Uh, sort of like our volume scanner, the container scanner is broken into two pieces. The first is a, one we can do quickly, and one is a little more involved. The quick check we call the metadata check. Um, this is just a fast check to make sure that the container is still overall present on the disk. Um, each storage container is represented by a directory, so we're going to want to see is that directory still there, is it still readable, and there's a metadata file in there as well. We're going to just check the checksum on that and make sure that all the data in there checks out. So basically saying, we believe this container is still here. Um, we can do this quickly because there's going to be a ton of containers on all of these disks, um, but we haven't yet gone through and looked at all of the blocks that are in there. To do that, we use the data check which is a more involved scan. So this is actually going to go through all of the blocks that are in the container after doing the metadata check. It's going to check their lengths and checksums against the metadata that's in RocksDB to make sure that everything is still consistent. So um, we actually throttle this check so that it's not eating up all of the disk bandwidth um, and interfering with the front end loads. So this means that it can run uh, a little slowly. Um, we do have one thread per volume that's running. So it's paralyzed in that sense, um, but it's still possible that for dense disks, the container scanner is, you know, continuously slowly 
uh, walking through in the background uh, looking at all the bytes. Um, another thing to note is that if there's a failure here, say, say one of the blocks in the container is corrupted. Um, the data node is actually going to mark the whole container as unhealthy and trigger replication for the whole container. Um, so you might wonder, you know, why, why not just move the one block? Why, why copy the whole container? Um, so if you look at the frequency of these failures, um, things like network failure are probably going to be the most common. Um, full disk failure is going to be uh, one of the more common failures, but uh, individual bit rot or cosmic rays or anything flipping bits on a disk like this, um, where you know one block out of a whole group of blocks is corrupted, is going to be relatively rare. Um, we still need to check this for durability, um, but basically we uh, kind of made a design decision within Ozone that was since this is a pretty rare failure, um, it'll be much simpler just to copy the whole container from a healthy source um, rather than trying to do sort of a byte-by-byte -byte reconstruction to fix just the parts that are missing based on the data that's in other replicas. So when we've talked about these scanners, we've talked about them more in a background context as threads that are running in the background um, and you know, kind of continuously checking the data, making sure that even if it's not accessed, um, it's still there and still consistent for when it needs to be accessed. Um, we actually have another type of scan that we do in the data nodes. Um, we call these the on-demand scans. So these are triggered when a failure is encountered when operating with the container. So while the background scans are checking all of your data that uh, may not be being accessed, um, they may be slower, the on-demand scans are going to be triggered for data that is actively being accessed. If we have a failure accessing that data, we have probable cause that something might be wrong with it, but like uh, efficiently triaging the failure is kind of hard. So what we're going to do is we're going to dish the, the actual triage off to these background scanners to, you know, asynchronously in the background say, hey, I saw some error. I don't know what I saw. Can you figure it out? So let's look at this. Um, if we bring the client in. Let's say, we have a, let's say we have a failure on one of these containers. Um, and the background scanner maybe hasn't gotten to it yet. It's still working through other containers. Um, in this example, we could say, you know, maybe the metadata file on that uh, storage container is corrupted. Now the client comes in and tries to read from that storage container. Uh, it's going to get an error in this case, and that's going to fail. The data node doesn't exactly know why it failed. It's going to see some kind of error, and so it's going to dish both the disk and the container off to their respective queues for on-demand scanning. The client itself is going to have to retry on another node um, so that when the client is reading from the data node, it's actually gotten the locations of all three of the replicas from the Ozone Manager. So if there's an issue reading from one replica, it's just going to go off and find one of the other replicas and try to read from that. Uh, meanwhile, the on-demand scanners are going to actually look at this problem. Um, and in this example here, they're going to say, hey, the disk looks fine to me, but I found corruption in this container. So now let's look at what happens next. The data node is going to report that unhealthy container to SCM. SCM has a global view of which other data nodes have healthy replicas. It's going to pick one and tell it to push that replica to another data node. The data node that receives it's going to report back to SCM saying that it has the replica. And now that SCM has finished that replication, it's going to say that it's safe to delete that unhealthy replica from the node. So there's one more big portion in the read-write path that we haven't talked about yet, um, and that's our client up here. So we've mentioned, for example, when talking with the ozone managers, how the client is going to fail over if there's some sort of failure in the leader. Um, and we've talked about with uh, SCM managing write pipelines, how the, um, the client will be redirected to a new write pipeline if there's an issue with a data node. Um, but we haven't really talked about uh, corruption or data integrity uh, coming from the client. How do we make sure that the data that we're pushing over the wire is coming to and from the client consistently? So let's start by looking at the write path. On the client side, the client's going to take the data um, that it's going to write and generate a checksum and push both of those over the wire to the data node. The data node is going to verify that these match. Uh, if it doesn't, then it's going to send a failure back to the client. The client's going to have to retry on a new node. Uh, 
And finally, the data node is going to persist both of these pieces of information for use later. So this is the checksum that the container scanners are going to be using when they're verifying the data. Um, it's also going to be used when the client comes back oh, after React. Act, finish it up. And now when the client comes back to read, we're going to end up using the same block and checksum. Client requests the data. Data node locates it. Data node sends the checksum and the block back to the client. And then the client verifies that everything matches. And again, if there's no match here, then the client is going to have to retry uh, the read from a different data node replica. So um, Ozone is uh, evolving pretty fast, so of course we have uh, quite a list of future improvements that would be nice to have in this area. Uh, one that we're looking at right now is improvements on the right checksum side. Um, I've got a Jira issue linked over here, and there's a pull request where there's actually some discussion going on right now in this area. Um, another is that in this talk, we've primarily talked about hard failures, so that's things uh, failing out completely. Uh, soft failures are a different case, so this would be things where nodes or disks are running slowly, um, but still overall appear to be functioning. Uh, these are a little harder to detect, but it's still a good thing to detect. For example, if you have a client writing to three data nodes, and one of those nodes is slow, that node can kind of back up the whole write pipeline. Um, so there's some mechanisms we can look into to doing this. Um, one is, for example, you can have uh, data nodes report back to SCM and Recon, the observability server, um, of nodes that they think are slow. And these components then have an overall view of all the nodes, and they can look at who's voting on who is slow. And, you know, SCM can redirect writes away from slow nodes. Recon can alert the admin that, hey, I think there's a problem with this node, this disk. Um, the other nodes seem to be thinking it's running slowly. Um, Another thing is uh, where we store the checksums. So right now, checksums are stored in RocksDB. Um, there's also been some uh, discussions about uh, storing the checksums actually as a header in the block file. So if you were to uh, zero copy directly from the block file to the network socket when moving data back to the client um, or getting data from the client, um, if the checksum is stored in a header, then the client can just uh, combine all of that data and we don't need to separate the checksum off and put it into RocksDB. Um, there's also a lot of tools uh, that exist already around uh, disk failure detection. Uh, Smart is one example. Um, so there's also the possibility of embedding these kinds of tools in Ozone's disk monitoring as well. Um, RocksDB has its own checksumming mechanism. Um, checksums that are stored when we write data into RocksDB that are verified on read. Um, so there's also the possibility of introducing some sort of RocksDB integrity scanner kind of thing in the future. Uh, and finally, we have metrics for all of these scanners. Um, and so we've set up default configs. Everything we've talked about here is tunable. Um, I do have the config keys in here. The slides are hidden right now, but when the slides are shared out um, after each section, there's actually a section on the config keys that can be used to tune um, the various fault handling that's happening here. Um, we've picked defaults that we think are reasonable, but it's important to look at um, you know, various ozone deployments over time and look at the metrics. Um, things like how much bandwidth are we giving to the scanners, how frequently are they running, how many failures are they finding, that kind of thing. Um, and we can tune these defaults to work better for the majority of cases. Last thing I want to mention is uh, we do have a storage group meetup happening on October 25th. So this is going to be at Clutter's Santa Clara office, and there's also going to be an online version as well. Um, we've got talks from Uber and Cloudera on a few Apache projects in the storage space. Uh, that's a QR code you can scan if you want more information. Um, but other than that, uh, that's the end of the talk, and it looks like we have time for questions. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so that depends on the component, right? So in Ozone Manager and Storage Container Manager, if there's a RocksDB failure, the node is going to shut itself down because it can't uh, process any more transactions from the wrap forum, and a new node is going to step up as a leader. Uh, in the meantime, you're going to get some alert, you know, that this node has stopped running on, you know, whatever control plane you're using, and the, there'll be a log message that says, you know, you couldn't write to RocksDB, um, whatever the error was. Um, and so basically, you're going to need to triage that failure and say, um, you know, is the disk bad? Is RocksDB corrupted? 
um, that kind of thing. But you can always just um, you know wipe the rocks DB or replace the disk, and because the other two nodes have all of the data, they can catch up that new node when it's restarted. On the data node side, where there's one rocks DB per volume, um, the rocks DB failure it would actually be considered a volume failure, so we'd have to uh, re-replicate the data from other volumes. Yeah, so on the, so on the data, data nodes have uh, multiple disks, and each disk has uh, one rocks DB that's storing metadata for the containers. But that metadata is replicated because that's the same, that's the same metadata as the other replicas of the containers. So we can actually get the data back from those other replicas. Yeah, so you would, um, if the RocksDB on the volume fails, we would consider it a volume failure. Um, so we would have to, the data would be rewritten from other replicas onto existing space in the cluster. And their metadata, when you re-replicate the container, the metadata travels with it, and it would be ingested into those other RocksDB instances. Yes? Sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, good question. Um, so actually most recent version of Ozone has support for decommission um, on the master nodes and we've had decommission and maintenance on the data nodes for a while. So the difference between those, if we're talking about data nodes, your options are decommission and maintenance. Decommission is going to say, I'm going to remove the data node from this cluster and I want you to re-replicate all of its data. I don't think this node is ever coming back. Maintenance says, I'm gonna turn off this data node, but it's coming back, so don't panic, don't trigger a bunch of replications. Um, it'll be restarted soon. Um, so for like an OS upgrade, for example, you would probably wanna put your data node in maintenance mode um, and then restart it up. Um, and for the master nodes, um, we just have decommission. Uh, that's because the membership in that uh, forum is static, so it's three nodes, so you can uh, there's a decommission CLI you can use and that will uh, stop that node and the graft ring will say, okay, you know, this node is stopped, um, it's okay, we'll elect a new leader, things will carry on, you can do your upgrade, you can turn it back on, um, recommission it, it'll rejoin the ring and you can kind of keep doing that around for all three of your metadata nodes. <laughs> 